The Sword of Redemption. Lady Olivier, a voice called through a nearby Vox. Sarai finished buttoning her dress uniform before opening the channel. The cutter from the Sanguinium Martyrs has arrived, and will be completing its landing cycle soon. Good she replied, turning her attention to her headband as she continued. Have the second platoon hold them there, I will be down in just a moment. In the meantime, continue your scans to ensure nothing came through with them. Yes, my lady. The Vox closed out just as Sarai slipped her headband on, her powers dropping back to manageable levels. Taking a moment to ready herself, she turned and stepped out of her room, two Kasrakan guards forming up behind her as she made her way down the main hall to the hangar. There were a number of alternate paths that would have gotten her to the hangar without having to take in the gaudiness of the main hall, bedecked as it was in gold and the trophies of her mentor's expeditions, but time was of the essence and Sarai did not wish to keep her guests waiting for much longer. Allowing suspicions to rise would only complicate matters. Sarai turned and stepped into the hangar, spotting the cutter on the far end of the floor. Between her and the newcomers stood a platoon of Kasrakan, the troopers holding a loose formation around the cutter as they waited for her. Even with her headband on she could feel the mix of emotions radiating from the troopers, Kadaya may have died seven years prior, but these soldiers were still ready and willing to face down any new threats, perhaps a bit too eager. At ease, soldiers, she called, drawing attention from the Kasrakan. Let us not be too hasty in greeting our, guests. The Kasrakan said nothing, but did draw back to allow Sarai and her bodyguards to step forward, just as the ramp to the cutter lowered. Sarai stopped, crossing her arms behind her back as the first of the new arrivals appeared. Down the ramp came five sisters of battle, members of the Order of Our Martyred Lady if their black armor and red robes were any indication. The Sister Superior and one of her subordinates were helmeted, leaving two others Sarai guessed were twins and a cheery-looking girl carrying, a gold-plated heavy flamer. Sarai had to stop herself as she surveyed the group once more, noting that one of the twins had a similarly colored Narthesium strapped to her arm. Sororitas do not indulge in that level of decadence, not all of them, anyways. Perhaps some kind of artifact? Sarai was so caught up in speculation that she almost missed the next group. Inquisitor Velas, she guessed, flanked on either side by two Valhallen stormtroopers. The Inquisitor was haggard, his face scruffy and lined, but he was trying his damnedest to appear alert and prepared for all that he would face. He was not as jumpy as some members of the Ordo Zenos Sarai had encountered during her time as an Inquisitor but perhaps his weariness was behind that. Next was a sight Sarai had never expected to see in her lifetime, even if news of the Primarch's return had been circulating quickly in the last ten years. A black-skinned giant clad in green and golden armor, so tall he almost knelt trying to get out from the cutter. A gilded hammer and a golden-tipped spear dangled from his waist, and his back was covered in a cloak of dragon scales. Once he had freed himself from the cutter the Primarch turned and gave the assembled soldiers a friendly smile, one that Sarai found herself returning despite the shock of seeing a Primarch in the flesh. That left the final member of the entourage, the only person in the entire Imperium Sarai was dreading to see, save perhaps Celestia, but then that was another matter entirely. Her hair was a mite longer than the grainy photo she had seen from the Empress reveal her toned body visible even beneath the administratum robes she wore. Her eyes darted about in a mix of wonder and concern, as if she were stepping into the Imperium for the first time. She appeared to carry no weapons on her, but she was Celestia's student, her very being was a weapon unto itself, and if the reports Sarai had read were to be believed she was quite adept at wielding her powers. Sarai would play it safe, lest she out herself any further to Twilight Sparkle. Welcome aboard the Sword of Redemption, Sarai said once the new arrivals were all assembled. I apologize for the martial greeting, but I have to take all precautions. Understandable, the other Inquisitor replied. He turned slightly and motioned for Twilight to come forward. This is the Empress student, Tara. As you can see she is alive and healthy, just as I said she would be. H hello, the student stammered keeping a friendly smile up as she made eye contact with Sarai. It's a pleasure to meet you, Inquisitor Olivier. You may call me Sarai, if that is easier for you to remember. Sarai allowed her gaze to soften. 
I understand that you have been through much since the Empress brought you into this whole mess, but there's no need to fear me. Twilight blinked a few times, though her smile did grow more confident as Surai turned back to the others. Briefly her mind fell towards how she would approach the Prim Arch. To treat someone of that stature as merely a member of an Inquisitor's entourage would be inappropriate if not horrendously insulting, but then genuflecting and copious praise might undercut her rapport with Velas and Twilight Sparkle. No, it wouldn't. They understand what it's like to stand in the presence of gods, perhaps even better than I. And, she started, keeping her eyes from meeting the Primarcha's own. And I see we are joined by one of the Empress Primarchas a quick bow would suffice as a sign of respect. Forgive me, my lord, but if I had known you would be gracing us with your presence I would have done away with all this suspicion and dash. There is no need to apologize for doing your duty, the Primarch said, his voice soothing. And I am not one that you must always refer to me as lord. You may call me Fukin if you wish. If that is what you say, L- Fukin. Sarai replied, rising up and smoothing a wrinkle out of her uniform. Well then, it is good to see that my suspicions were unfounded, especially if one travels in the company of a primarch a gross simplification, but if it would set their minds at ease. On the subject of travels, Inquisitor Velas started. We are in need to return to the Imperium, preferably somewhere where my ship can be repaired. Of course. Sarai said, turning back to the other Inquisitor. As it happens, you have had the fortune of arriving quite close to Ultramar, a few light years directly down from the systems to be exact. One did not have to be a telepath to see the shock and frustration radiating from the Inquisitor, but Sarai did find herself reaching out to touch his mind all the same. Down. Of course, it would have to be down. Of all the ways the universe seeks to destroy us. The Inquisitor's mind calmed the man himself turning slightly to hide his face from Twilight. Calm, Mashes. Twilight is safe, and this Inquisitor won't do anything to harm her, for now. So he knew Twilight was not from the Imperium. The girl seemed to trust him, so Sarai would not have to worry about him doing anything irrational to hurt Twilight. If he would do anything against the Ordo Malleus would have to be seen. What are you doing? Sarai's power snapped back at Twilight's question. I'm sorry, she asked, turning back to the other girl. I sensed you were using some kind of spell just then, Twilight continued. It didn't seem threatening, but I was curious as to just what it was that you were doing. At the word spell, all the sisters and Inquisitor Vela snapped their attention to Sarai. A veteran Inquisitor would not shrink away from such surprise, though Sarai could feel her jaw tightening as the situation became more tense. I am sorry. I did not know it would be an issue, she said, raising a hand to calm the others. I am a tele-empathy, and I had hoped to ease some of Lord Vela's worries concerning the circumstances of your arrival back in real space. I meant no offense. Tele-empathy. Twilight asked, pushing aside some of her bodyguards as she drew closer to Sarai. Like, a combination of telepathy and empathic sensation. Yes, Sarai started taking a step back to compensate for the younger woman's enthusiasm. I take it you've heard of this branch of study. I studied it when I was younger, back when the Empress first took me on as a student, but I was never any good. Twilight gave a shrug before continuing. But, if you're not against it, I'd love for a chance to study your notes. Oh, of course. Sarai said, giving a glance back to Inquisitor Velas and the Sisters of Battle. They did not seem placated, so Sarai sought a different approach. I am well aware of the corruption spread by demonic forces, Inquisitor. Given the circumstances of your arrival I have every right to be suspicious of those that are brought aboard my ship, but you have nothing to fear from me. True as that may be, I have had some issues with other Inquisitors saying they meant no ill will towards me. Inquisitor Velas replied. Sarai had done her research and had an idea of what the man was referring to but had no chance of addressing this before Fukin spoke up. Let us not fall into accusations of wrongdoing, my friends, he said. We are all seeking to perform the duties the Imperium has set upon us, and needless fear and bickering will only obstruct our paths. I am sure Miss Olivier meant no malice by her actions. The sisters seemed to relax at this, lowering their weapons as their focus drifted back towards twilight. 
Inquisitor Velas said nothing, though Sarai could feel that some of his nervousness had subsided, some. I know it may take some time for you to believe me, but I am on your side, Sarai started. Perhaps after we have arranged safe passage and boarding for your crew and a Mechanicus salvage of your ship, you may begin to see that. Your ship isn't much larger than mine, Velas countered. Even with the escorts it will be a tight fit. The Sword of Redemption is deceptively spacious, Lord Velas, it helps that Elias and his brothers are not aboard. And I'm sure the Mechanicus would not mind having a few extra hands to assist with towing your ship to Drydock. A pause before Sarai shrugged. Consider it for now. If all else fails I'm sure there are a few independent transports in the area that wouldn't mind a little extra money assisting with the rescue of the Empress student. I can help with some of the recovery work, Twilight offered, eagerly looking between Sarai and Inquisitor Velas. At least with coordination, anyway. I've been working on some ideas to get the crew off the Sanguinium Martyrs in my spare time, and maybe I could work out a few of the kinks with you before we start transporting everyone over. Terra, Velas started, but Sarai was quick to speak first. Perhaps some other time, Sarai said, giving Twilight a smile to keep her placated. I have some other duties to attend to, and I am sure you all would like some time to rest. Um, Twilight's enthusiasm waned. Well. I guess. It's settled, then. Sarai turned towards the Kasrakan platoon behind her. My men will show you to your rooms and begin making arrangements for the rest of your team's arrival. Lord Velas, if you would come with me we can contact the Mechanicus to recover your ship. If it's all the same to you, I think I would rather make sure the Empress student is secured before committing to any further actions. Doing his best to not expose himself quickly. Velas might have been young and headstrong, but he knew his job well enough. And if it keeps me away from Twilight Sparkle a little longer, all the better for him. Very well. I will send for you when preparations are made. The rooms provided turned out to be quite spacious, more akin to the guest rooms on a governor's personal ship than standard imperial barracks. Actual beds and utilities greeted the newcomers with multiple racks for weapons and armor along with ample light to keep the quarters pleasantly illuminated depending on the ship's cycle. The hum of the ship seemed dull, as if the entire structure had powered down, leaving the guest quarters quiet save for the occasional disturbance of cleaning cherubs. The Lady Inquisitor was even kind enough to provide a healthy supply of rations for each room, complete with pure water and pieces of real fruit. Even for the Empress student, it is still a bit, much, Masha's thought. At least she's not as self-righteous as Marcos was, Masha's turned, picking up the Valhallans' conversation as Alexis watched the corridor. No as intrusive, either, I haven't seen a single crew member or servitor that she could use to spy on us down here. She's a lady inquisitor, Alexis, Nikolai countered as he came up behind his brother. Who knows what kind of setup she has to keep an eye on her guests and constantly watching the corridors will do us no good in laying low, Masha said, drawing the two troopers back to him. Inquisitor Olivier has all the advantages now. Our only hope is to play along as best we can, keep our heads down until we get back to civilization and get Terra to the Empress. With all due respect, my lord, that's going to be rather difficult, especially if she's a mind reader a pause before Alexis grinned. Granted. I can think of a few thoughts I wouldn't mind her reading. Keep those and I'll be the one to shoot you. Mashes replied. Admittedly, it is not the worst idea, white noise and nonsense data might be enough to keep the Inquisitor from prying too deep into our minds without warning. We're just troopers, my lord, Nikolai said. We only know what you tell us. What of Terra or you? Considering that she probably already knows Twilight's Azenos, I'll take what little I can get. Psychic resistance is something I have trained with before after all, I've had Angelique under my care for longer than you have been in my service. Masha straightened up. And I don't intend on leaving here with Tara any longer than she needs to, though I don't think that will be much of an issue. If you say so, my lord. Alexis turned back towards the hall, giving Masha some time to reflect. He did not have long, for out of the shadows came an officer and a small squad of Kasrakan, the man giving a salute once he was certain he was close enough to Masha's. Lord Velas, the officer said. 
Lady Olivier has requested an audience with you in her quarters. I am here to escort you there. Did she say why she wished to discuss matters there? Mashas asked. That is not a matter I was made aware of, the officer said. If you would please, Lord Mashas, Lady Olivier does not enjoy being kept waiting. I'll be the judge of that, Mashas thought, but he refrained from speaking further on the matter. Finally he gave a short nod, stepping out to meet the officer as the Valhallans formed up behind him. Very well, Mashas said. Lead on the officer nodded, turning and starting off back down the hall while Mashas and his henchmen followed behind. The quietness of the guest quarters soon gave way to the usual rumblings of any imperial vessel, the dull roar of engines, choral music to complement, and the continued rustling of servitors and crewmen as they went about their duties. To Masha's dismay the path took them back into the main hall, the glittering of gold-plated statues almost blinding him as they stepped in. Tapestries of all sorts broke up the seemingly unending line of statues, though Masha's noted none of them seemed to bear the red-headed visage of Lady Olivier among them. No real achievements to be seen, he mused. Either she is more humble than most, or she is newer to her position than she lets on. Their path took them away from the main hall, down another corridor lined with what appeared to be runes of some sort. Most mashes could identify as typical anti-psychic wards, holy symbols and icons that he had learned since he was a child. Others, though, were far more alien in their design, swooping hieroglyphs that shimmered with energy as mashes and the soldiers passed by. As mashes inspected them, he saw a number of familiar patterns among the hieroglyphs, shapes resembling trees and sanctuaries breaking up the other odd twists and squiggles, not too dissimilar from Twilight's own handwriting. Lord Velas, Mashes was snapped out of his inspection by the officer, the Kasrakan having parted to reveal a door marked with the inquisitorial eye. Inquisitor Olivier is waiting for you inside. Your guards will have to stay with us for now. Forgive me if I do not feel safe without some form of protection, Mashes said. While he did have his pistol and some light armor under his robes, having a few bodies around him could be of some use against a fully prepared lady inquisitor. Inquisitor Olivier insisted to speak with you in private. She said that it concerns information in regards to the student, words meant for your ears only. Mashes said nothing, but he had a good idea of what exactly the Lady Inquisitor meant. Honestly, he would be surprised if she didn't already know about Twilight. Perhaps that's where the wards are from. I understand. He said finally, casting a glance to Alexis and Nikolai. Stay here until I return. My lord, are you sure this dash Nikolai started before Mashes waved him off? If things go wrong, alert the sisters and Lord Fukin. They should be enough to protect Terra. Nikolai hesitated, but eventually the trooper gave a short nod and stood at ease. Mashes turned and stepped towards the door, waiting as it slid open and he was able to step through to Inquisitor Oliver's quarters. Though the room was massive, easily half the size of a medium-sized mess hall, it was surprisingly sparse in its decor. Between two large windows giving a view of the ship's spine hung a faded tapestry of Sebastian Thor, the long-dead reformer looking down on a floor populated by a few soft chairs and a small glass table. A bottle of wine stood with a pair of glasses on the table, and even from afar mashes could see the faint remnants of condensation indicating that it had only recently been pulled from chilling. To the right mashes saw two more doors, most likely leading to sleeping quarters, while the left side of the room was blocked from view by the wall jutting out farther than it had first appeared. Mashes stepped forward, sweeping his gaze around in case he had missed anything, when his vision fell upon the altar on the far wall. Atop a rack rested a suit of gold and red powered armor, most likely Inquisitor Oliver's giving its size and shape. Before the rack was the altar, on which rested a battered sniper rifle and a large greatsword that seemed to glow with a faint light. Anything beyond that was conjecture, for Inquisitor Olivier stood before the altar, her back to Mashes as she gazed up at her armor. Mashes said nothing, doing his best to shift his thoughts to random nonsense lest the Inquisitor probe his mind again. Do you know they chained down psychers aboard the black ships? Inquisitor Olivier asked, still not looking towards Mashes. I tend to focus my attention on things other than the domains of the other Ordos, Mashes replied. I was a child when I was taken aboard the black ships. 
I don't know if it was because of pity or fear some of the others would harm me, but I was kept in isolation all throughout my trip to Terra a pause as Inquisitor Olivia turned her head, glimpsing Masha's out of the corner of her eye. My body was shackled, but my mind was not. And trapped with thousands of other confused and broken souls for months, years maybe, was not a position I would wish for any telepath. It was not enough of a warning if you go and freely poke around in the minds of your guests. Perhaps that was a bit harsh, but if it kept the Inquisitor on the back foot. An accident, nothing more. Inquisitor Olivier waved her hand and turned to face Mashes. The headband I wear keeps me from constantly hearing the thoughts of those around me, but even it cannot hold off the strongest of emotions, such as that of your frustration at being so close to rescue and not even realizing it. Though I thank you for your concern, the situation you've presented does not exactly instill confidence in the security of myself or my charges. You speak of twilight, then. Ripping the bandages off quickly, aren't we? Mashes said nothing as Inquisitor Olivier continued. I take it that there's more to such things than merely disguising her as Terra, is there? You're the telepath, you don't need me to answer that. Let's not be rude now, Inquisitor Velas. As much as you may distrust me, I am on your side. Mashes said nothing as Inquisitor Olivier stepped past him, crossing over to the table in the center of the room and picking up the wine. We all have blood on our hands, chains that have shackled us even if we appear free. Some are more bloodied than others, but I would never betray the Imperium or the Empress. Again Mashes said nothing, but he did notice a slight hesitation in the way the other Inquisitor said Empress. Past guilt, perhaps? That would be interesting considering her previous indications of hesitancy when dealing with Twilight. Prying would be in order. Would you care for a drink? Inquisitor Olivier asked, uncorking the wine and pouring herself a glass. I reviewed your service record, Lord Velas, and I'm surprised it never crossed through Ultramar at any point. Iaxian wine is a rare treasure in these times. I will have to pass for now, Mashes said, thoughts of drugged chalices crossing his mind before he pressed on. For someone that has been sent to recover Twilight, and one who said she wished to speak directly with the student, you seem rather disinterested in connecting with her. Parameters have changed. My orders were to recover the Empress student, nothing more the woman shrugged as she took up her wine. I have done so, and have spoken enough with her to see she is in good hands. My task complete, I will convey you to Ultramar where you will be safe. Given what information I have gleaned about the schism, and what enemies seem to arrange against Twilight, I doubt that anywhere save directly in the Empress presence would be considered safe. What foes? Mashes said nothing at first as if waiting for Inquisitor Olivier to answer her own question. When she did not, Mashes continued. We were attacked by heretic forces, as you know. From what the survivors of the group on Solemnus told me, Twilight was targeted by a particularly powerful daemon, perhaps something you might be familiar with. Daemons do enjoy taking a myriad of forms, Inquisitor Olivier replied. From how you structured your speech, I guess you were not among that party. No. Only Twilight and the sisters returned, if you want a better idea of the daemon that hunts her, you would be best to speak with any of them about what they saw. The sisters can be trusted, then. Why wouldn't they be? No sister of battle has fallen to the temptation of chaos in millennia, and they have been with Twilight almost as long as I have. Inquisitor Olivier fell silent, nursing her drink as she looked away from Mashes. I will have to speak with them on the matter, then the Inquisitor said. It has been some time since I have worked alongside the Sorrow Redis. Is there more you can tell me about Twilight? There isn't much more to say, Mashes said, his left hand flexing as he continued. She's a skilled psyker and a decent fighter. A bit naive and sheltered, but the Empress thinks highly of her and her optimism. Does she? Inquisitor Olivier turned away. Even from his position on the other side of the room, Mashes could tell the answer had shaken the woman, the slight tremble of her hand, a tightening of her jaw, all indicated there was more the Inquisitor did not wish to say. Well, I am not surprised. The Empress would not make a mistake when elevating someone to the position of her trusted student. I've encountered a few people who have thought otherwise, Mashes replied. The most vocal of them met his end quite gruesomely. 
though not at your hand, else you would have been lying in your debrief to the Ordo following your extraction from Caesarea a pause as Olivier turned back to Masha's. That, at least, I received through official channels. Despite what you may think, sometimes the Ordos will cooperate with one another when the need arises. Given that the last Inquisitor that offered to help me tried shooting the student, I cannot say I am in need of much help from the other Ordos. Mashes shifted his stance before continuing. If we are done with pleasantries, I would like to return and make sure Twilight is resting properly. If you say so. The Mechanicus informed me that they will arrive within a month to salvage your vessel and bring it to Koner for repairs. Macridge will be more secure, though, so I suggest you find transport there to wait until the ship is finished. No use in asking for a ride, then. I'll, consider it. Inquisitor Olivier took another sip of wine. As long as you keep the student away from me. Her optimism is welcome, but I have more important business to attend to within Ultramar. I will do what I can. Masha's turned to leave, stopping just before the door as another thought came to mind. Good luck on keeping her away, though, even with my help, the girl has a fascinating ability to get others to open up by their own volition. We shall see if that still holds up. Masha's turned and stepped out of the room, the door closing behind him as the Kasrakan and his henchmen straightened up at his return. I hope that your discussion with Lady Olivier was productive, the officer said. I will conduct you back to your quarters now. Masha's nodded, following after the officer as he once more inspected the runes around the hallway. Their exact purpose eluded him, for now, but there was no mistaking the unknown symbols for being anything other than script in Twilight's native tongue. Inquisitor Olivier knows more about Twilight than she would like to say, Masha's thought. I won't allow any dangers like that go unaddressed.